Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show where we explore the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. Strokes, they are brain attacks. They're also the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, and they happen when blood flow to an area of the brain is cut off. It causes parts of the brain to die, parts that don't come back. Survivors are often impaired for life. But a breakthrough treatment is changing all of that. It's called thrombectomy, and what it is doing for people is something you have to see for yourself. Do you guys want a snack? Sit at the counter. In their home almost an hour south of Atlanta, Case and Cannon Danbury climb the kitchen stools to gobble down their after-school snack prepared by their mom. The chopping of fruit, seemingly mundane, is extraordinary once you realize that the reason Audrey Danbury can maneuver through her kitchen, can chase her boys around the front yard, is because of a treatment so revolutionary, it has been compared to what penicillin did for treating infections. I work in the athletic department at the University of West Georgia, and I am an assistant athletic director. It was just kind of a regular day. Until it wasn't. I was sitting in my office at my desk, just behind my computer. Just could not focus on the computer screen. Um, there's two screens and it was just like everything was blurred. Just kind of started feeling dizzy and off balance and tried to stand up in my office and just kind of was leaning over. Couldn't stand up straight really. Audrey made her way out of her office where she ran into strength and conditioning coach Monty Curtis, who asked, Are you all right? You know, and she couldn't respond. I just was looking at him, and at that point, I realized I couldn't talk. Monty went from thinking she was upset to realizing something was very wrong. Something's not right here. I could tell that she wanted to say, to say something to me, but she couldn't get it out. He called 911. Then his wife, who is a nurse, she told him Audrey was having a stroke. It's got to happen now. I mean, time is like of the essence. She's got to get medical attention now. In the back of an ambulance, Audrey would hear that word for the first time to describe what was happening to her, her inability to speak or use her right arm. I could hear her radio to the air evac group saying that 28-year-old possible stroke, we want to take her to Grady. Symptoms began three hours ago. Try not to move, okay? Try not to move. He cannot move his left arm or leg. The good news is that he happens to have a lot of help from other arteries meaning that his brain is not, is not dying fast. Within a matter of minutes, he is in the angiography suite where the team will perform a thrombectomy. A catheter is threaded through his femoral artery in his groin up into the right middle cerebral artery of his brain, where a clot is blocking the artery. A device called a stent retriever will do just that, retrieve the clot and pull it from his body. Now you can see they're pulling back the catheter, so they're removing the stent retriever now. You can see the little dots on the stent retriever. The clot's right in there. It's coming down the neck. And now they're going to pull it out and see if they have any clot on it. This angiogram is a picture of the brain's blood vessels using contrast. The clot has been blocking blood flow to the right side of the brain. After the stent retriever successfully grabs the clot. So now you're going to see the blood flow here. He doesn't move too much. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah. So that's all. That was all not there before. So angiographically, a perfect result. Dr. Raul Noguera, director of the neuroendovascular division at Grady, shows the clot hanging on the tip of the catheter. Something so tiny, wreaking such havoc, causing hundreds of thousands of strokes and thousands of deaths each year. I understand. I heard 65 years of marriage. I got you. Well, this gives him the best chance, and so far, no complications that we've detected, but it's still early, like I said, and, uh, you know, there is always... We're not sure where the, which direction he, this is going to go, but we give him the best chance by doing this. So the artery's opened again, which is good. That means the right side of his brain has got the blood flow back, and hopefully that'll allow him to improve. Before he leaves Grady, the man will recover 90% of his function and will walk out on his own with his wife of 65 years. It's nothing short of a revolution for the stroke patients. It's a very, very powerful treatment. For a long time, the story of stroke was consistently dismal. Despite advances, the end result was often death or permanent disability. Grady was a top site in a clinical trial for tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, known as the clot-busting drug. It has been in use for over 20 years, but it must be given within four and a half hours, and the bigger the clot, the less likely it is to work. Enter thrombectomy, the mechanical removal of a clot from a blood vessel. We are on average close to doing one thrombectomy a day here uh, at Grady Memorial. Grady was a top site in a definitive trial in 2015 that showed that thrombectomy improved outcomes when done within six hours. Think of a stroke as a forest fire. It starts small, it burns a few trees, and over time it's gonna burn the whole forest. The forest fire theory of stroke is that each brain is different and that the fire that is stroke spreads at different rates, varying brain to brain. What is burned will not come back. So the goal is to save as much forest, as much brain as possible. Dr. Noguera believed that thrombectomy could help outcomes even beyond the six hour window. The only way to find out was to prove it. So he designed and led the landmark study completed in 2018 called the Dawn Trial. It shattered the six hour window, proving thrombectomy can be effective up to 24 hours after a stroke. The Dawn Trial had a global impact. As the name suggests, a new day, a new era of stroke treatment had arrived. The American Heart Association deemed it a top research breakthrough of the year. The forest fire analogy fits hand in glove with what Noguera calls the brain's blood vessels, the tree. It really looks like a tree. You have a trunk, and then that trunk will bifurcate, will branch out several times, and then you, you have several different brains. Before now, when a stroke happened and a bigger clot lodged in one of the bigger arteries, there was little to be done. Not anymore. Director of the Marcus Stroke and Neuroscience Center at Grady, Dr. Mike Frankel. The difference between a patient getting this procedure and not getting the procedure is dramatic. As in the case of Audrey Danbury, who had a clot blocking blood flow in her left middle cerebral artery. The blood clot deprives oxygen from getting to the left side of the brain, and it turns off the electricity, which basically makes it impossible to move your right side and impossible to speak or even to understand. If we can intervene before the brain dies, even though it's electrically not working, there's a window of opportunity, and opening that artery can turn the electricity back on and only have a little bit of damage as opposed to a lot of damage. And that means being able to walk, being able to talk, being able to get back to your activities of daily living, and potentially even your occupation, all these things. There is a saying in the world of stroke, time is brain. And on the day Audrey Danbury had her stroke, time was on her side. From the time 911 was called to them landing at Grady and handing me over was within 45 minutes. But time was against her husband, Ryan, who was in Charleston, South Carolina, for his monthly Air Force Reserve weekend when the doctors at Grady called him. They started telling me everything. I knew what a stroke was, and when they told me she's, we think she's having a stroke, I'm like, that is, <laughs> there's no way, like, that's impossible. She's 28 healthy. It's amazing that 
I do remember everything and I can, you know, be able to say how incredible that everything happened and be in that moment just wondering, was I ever gonna see any of them again? Audrey's stroke was severe. Doctors say without thrombectomy, she would have been permanently impaired or died. Instead, they retrieved the clot and she woke up. I felt fine, I mean, really. And then she called her husband, still racing back to Atlanta. I just said, hey, <laughs> and he, it was, you know, silence. Uh, Well, I had three hours to think about everything you could possibly think about after suffering a stroke. That was the worst three hours of my life. There were no effects afterward, nothing. And doctors never found the cause of Audrey's stroke. She was told chances of it happening again are incredibly slim. These days, the mundane is a gift. What is that? That's the dishes. And the dish ran away with the spoon, is that how it goes? Yeah. And when you look at this, before and after, you realize this is the tree, and thrombectomy is giving it life. Georgia is the buckle in what is known as the stroke belt, the name given to a nine-state region in the southeastern United States recognized by public health officials for having a higher rate of stroke. It isn't clear what makes it the stroke belt. There are many factors, maybe nutritional, access to care, socioeconomic, race, um, genetics, those things, they all interact and create this phenomenon that's been known about for more than 30 years. Some of the risk factors for stroke include smoking, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, sedentary lifestyle. Hypertension and smoking account for over 50% of all strokes. Ischemic stroke is the most common type of stroke. It is usually caused by a blood clot, also called a thrombus, that blocks or plugs an artery in the brain. Thrombectomy is the mechanical removal of that clot. Transient ischemic attacks, TIAs, they occur when the blood supply to the brain is interrupted briefly, causing stroke symptoms for only a few minutes. Having a TIA can mean you are at risk for having a more serious stroke. Hemorrhagic strokes are less common, making up 15% of all strokes, but they're responsible for about 40% of all stroke deaths. A hemorrhagic stroke is when either a brain aneurysm burst or a weakened blood vessel leaks. Blood then spills into or around the brain and creates swelling and pressure, damaging tissue in the brain. Surgery may be needed to repair a rupture, stop the bleeding, or alleviate pressure from the accumulated blood. Both types of strokes kill brain tissue, so it's important to remember the saying, time is brain. With that in mind, people need to think fast, and this acronym is an easy way to look for symptoms of stroke, such as sudden weakness on one side of the face or sudden weakness in an arm or difficulty speaking. With any of these symptoms, time is important, so call 911. The good news is there are things you can do to prevent a stroke. One of the most important is to lower your blood pressure if you have high blood pressure, also called hypertension. You can do this by reducing salt, avoiding high cholesterol foods such as burgers and ice cream and donuts, eat four to five cups of fruits and vegetables every day, exercise for 30 minutes a day, more if possible. Taking medication is often needed to control high blood pressure, so a regular visit to your primary care provider is absolutely critical for preventing a stroke. And if you smoke, quit. Even if you've smoked for years, stopping now will reduce your risk of stroke. Lose weight if you need to. Eat less and move more. If you drink wine, beer, or other alcohol, do it in moderation. 
Even with innovative treatment like thrombectomy, people who have strokes often need physical rehabilitation to try to regain function. And here is where science and music collide. As musicians with London's Royal Philharmonic Orchestra travel the world, they also play and perform music with stroke patients. It's part of a therapeutic program the Philharmonic created, and it's called Strokestra. In a hotel lobby, there are first time hellos and hello again hugs, leaving an outside world where things aren't so easy, where steps are hard fought, where most are still fighting. Let's go. And just like that, these dozen Emory Brain Health stroke patients, with their husbands and wives and doctors and therapists, join musicians from London's world renowned Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Yes, that orchestra, to create a brand new strokestra. Conductor, Dr. Tim Steiner. I'm actually a doctor of music, which means I can fix music. <laughs> but I can't, I can't fix you back. The Royal Philharmonic helped create this stroke rehab program two years ago, a program where whimsy and wonder rule where self-conscious jitters <laughs> quickly evaporate. Patients direct Fraser, the bassoon player. The cacophony of competing sounds eventually gives way to something cohesive. I was scared to death. Sam Macon is grateful to have Patty, his wife of 50 years, with him today. She put out what I was going to wear, and it's not all the time, but you just look really the, nice, too. Thank you so much. Doctors didn't know if Alvin Dunlop would survive. Now, he's keeping the beat. Because I saw him today. The look on his face, I hadn't seen that in a long time. There's something on music that gives joy. It elevates people's, not only mood, but their social interaction. Harvard's Dr. Ron Hirschberg and Emory Brain Health's Dr. David Burke have spent their careers helping people heal their brains. Today, they are members of the Strokestra. People connect with music even in the darkest, deepest moments. Music can, can connect with them. Neuroplasticity is really the brain's ability to change by experience-driven input. And so rhythm and music really are universal. There's a part of the primitive brain in all of us that has some understanding of music. Research into music has shown that it helps the brain recover from injury. It has been used to help stroke patients walk faster and recover their speech. There are rhythm centers in the brain in the motor cortex, also in the cerebellum in the back of the brain, and deep in the brain in the basal ganglia. And so there is, you know, the cortex on the outside of the brain, and then the inner part is the subcortex. But there are motor pathways that can be stimulated by different areas of enrichment. And rhythm can sort of, in a sense, trick the basal ganglia, can, can step in with a cue that is lost from the stroke. That's what people are trying to harness. Physical therapist Dr. Sarah Blanton works with these patients, and at this rehearsal, she saw one of them do something surprising. Ralph McCluggage hadn't played the trombone for years before his stroke, and certainly not since his stroke. And his wife convinced him to bring it that day, and he played it with his weaker hand for the first time in years. That was just absolutely thrilling to me. I was just so excited. <laughs> And then there is Debbie Botner, who had to be convinced to come. My dad said I couldn't carry a tune across the street. And they said, you're going to be playing with the Royal Philharmonic. I said, no. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. The big performance is tomorrow. Nerves are beginning. Well, I'll probably shake, but I've got a tambourine. That's good. <laughs> One, two, three. Before a crowd of global rehabilitation experts, the Strokestra jam session begins. Truth is
is on display, reminding us some things are lost, unable to be recovered. An even greater truth, there is much that can be rediscovered, a sense of community, of pride, of joy. We gain stuff from each other. We are strong for each other. I would do this again. That'll do it for us this week. See you next time on Your Fantastic Mind. Support for Your Fantastic Mind provided by Southern Company Charitable Foundation.